Hi there, my name is Odin and I'd like to welcome you to the Amsterdam Eye Still Center. Today we're going to talk about gin. Not just any gin, but actually Odin's gin. And I know many of you follow my recipes. This is not an easy recipe, not to say it's too difficult to make. But it's my own recipe, the one that I will actually be selling under the label of New Dutch Legacy in a few weeks time. So this is what we're going to do today. We're going to do a distillation run. But prior to that, of course, we're going to look at what do you need to make a gin, how do you make a gin, and what kind of herbs do you need to make it. If you're going to make a gin, there's of course a few things you need. Alcohol, distilling device, herbs, and a procedure on how to turn those three into a great tasting gin. If we start with the alcohol, many of you that make gin or intend to make gin actually buy in GNS. And I'm fine with that, as long as you test your GNS yourself and make sure there's no heads or tails present, you can work with it in making a gin. Especially since while gin making, you do cut for either heads and tails. You don't collect all the alcohol. But really the best thing you can do is either make your own vodka and make a gin from that, or use a GNS and turn it into a vodka by redistilling it once more. That's about the alcohol I want you to use. As far as herbs are concerned, of course juniper is predominantly there to flavor your gin, but you can play with coriander, with angelica root, with cardamom, uh, with lime, or with other things. Just be creative about it. Gin is about creativity, about making your own gin. And I think what gin means to the distilling industry, especially to the booming craft distilling industry, is what IPAs mean to craft brewing industry. It's the herbs, instead of the hops, at beer making, that allow you to make something that is really special and really your own. So alcohol, herbs, here's an example of the juniper berries that we actually use, very good ones. Most important is that the quality is always the same, so your batch stays the same, and that the berries are relatively fresh, so you should be able to squeeze them and get a little bit of moisture out of them. That's on the herbs. In general, go for around 30 to 35 grams of herbs per liter. If you want to know exactly, just go to my recipes online and use them. Third thing you need is a distilling device. And there's a lot of talk about what kind of still you need and how you need to use it in order to make gin. Well, it's very easy. Of course, the best still you can use is an ice still. Uh, I say that for two reasons. First of all, because I develop, design and manufacture them. And secondly, a lot of our customers win prizes making gin all over the world. San Francisco, ADI Conference, uh, New York International Spirits Affair, you name it. Uh, our distilleries are there using ice stills to make beautiful products, among which a lot of gins. What's special about this column? Well, I'm not going to dive into that too deeply because, well, that's not really the topic of today, but it's a robotized uh, still that you can use as a pot still. And pot distillation is what you want. Pot distillation brings over a lot of flavor. If you make gin, you want your gin to be very flavorful. So pot distillation is the choice to go. Now procedures. How do you make from alcohol um, with the correct amount of herbs and a distilling device a great gin? There's actually two or three ways in which you can approach it. Today's, today a lot of people focus on vapor infusion. This means that the herbs go somewhere in the column and the vapors actually touch the herbs and take over oils. I'm not fond of that, that method and I will tell you why. The reason I'm not fond of vapor infusion is simply that vapor to herbs contact is only 1-2% to when compared to alcohol as a liquid to herbs contact. So in other words, if you put all the herbs in the boiler together with the alcohol where the herbs actually touch the berries, touch the herbs that you're going to make a gin of, you get a bolder tasting gin. Some folks say that doesn't work very well because it makes the gin cloudy. Cloudy gin actually means you got over too much tasty oils. Is that a defeat? I don't think so. I think it is the way to go if you want big and bold tasting gin. You can always dilute it with more vodka or neutral until you get the desired taste level. If you turn it around and do vapor infusion instead of boiler infusion, you will never get that big fat gin 
you will get a very limited amount of taste transfer and you can never up it. If you get big taste gin over, you can always turn it down and make it lighter if you like to. So playing around with boiler distillation, boiler distilled gin is the best way, best way to go. And in a minute I'm going to show you how to do that. Easy, put vodka in there, vodka that is like 96% strong. And if you do so, the first thing I want you to do is actually open, open your distilling device and do something very bold. These are juniper berries, we also have coriander. We're not going to mess around with them, we're just going to add them to the boiler and straight to the 96% alcohol. We can leave the berries and the coriander over there overnight and afterwards put the rest of the herbs in and fill up the boiler. We don't want to redistill 96%, what we actually want to redistill is something like 30%. 30% redistilled gives you gin of around 72%, which is perfectly fine. If you want to name it a London Dry style, or if you want to go a bit lower and get a more mellow, more subtle gin, which is personally what I like. So I added the coriander as well as the juniper berry directly into the boiler. They're not going to scorch anything, even though this unit is directly fired with electric elements in the wash. Um, the coriander as well as the juniper berries have a tendency to either float or to sink to the bottom, so they won't do any harm. You must be a bit more careful uh, with tea-like herbs that will probably soak up liquid and flow down and can actually touch either the bottom if it's directly heated with gas or the electric elements at the moment that you are uh, using electric elements to heat up your boiler and to make gin. Uh, the other herbs, so apart from the coriander and the berries, we're actually going to put in, here they are, hops cooking bags. These are used by brewers, they put hops in them. We're not going to put hops in them, what we're going to put in them is the rest of the herbs. The herbs, they actually have a tendency to sink down to the bottom in such a way that they can stick either to the elements or to the bottom, which we don't want because potentially you can scorch. Now one of the things you may wonder is like, okay, it's a little bit of work to put them in these bags, so why actually do not we use a double boiler instead of a single boiler like we do right now with direct fire, either gas or electric? The reason is very simple. The reason why we do direct heating is because direct heating is actually two reasons. It's more efficient, you don't have to heat up two boilers, and it gives over more taste. Direct heating creates temperature differences in your boiler. If you've got temperature differences in your boiler, even though one degree and not more than that, you get more of a Maillard reaction. More Maillard reaction creates a, creates a taste cascade, and that taste cascade is what you're, what you're after, because you want a big tasting gin, heavy gin. What else am I holding in my hand? Well, tap water. Why? We currently have around 70 liters of 96% in there, sitting with the berries, sitting with the coriander. 96% is too strong to redistill. So what we're actually going to do is put water in there. This tap is connected to a hot water source, so the water I will be adding will be warm. What's the advantage? The advantage is heat up time will take less time. Here we go. And it's nothing more than that. The only thing you now need to do is wait until the boiler is full. And I'm sure we can show you from a close-up how we're doing that. Yep. And the air coming. So, the boiler is filled with very hard warm water, alcohol, juniper berries and coriander seeds, so it's on to the next step. We're done filling, so we don't need a hose anymore. What we do need is the hops cooking bags. Very easy, we open them and we start loading them up with the herbs that we still got left, the ones that actually have a tendency to sink and maybe collect on the bottom. Just to be 200% sure you don't get scorching during your gin run, we put them in bags. So, I already put some St. John's Worth into the first 
hops cooking back. And now let's add some other ingredients like, in my case, orange peel, dried orange peel. Easy does it. Cardamom. Angelica root for a nice finish. Just to get the last bit out of there. And there we go. And that's it. Bag number one is ready. So the next step we're going to take is actually put those bags in the boiler. And that's very easy. We've got some hooks in there that we can hang those bags from. So the first thing I do is close it. You see I get some extra leeway which I calculated perfectly. So we are above the level of the heaters. Here we are. Bag number one is in. That's how easy it is. So we filled the boiler with alcohol. We added water to bring the ABV down to around 30%. All the herbs and berries are in the boiler, so we are ready to start the run. I'll show you how. Hello. First thing I want to talk you through, just for the gin run, is the menu. You always want to make sure you start with factory settings. Now, is there anything I want to change for a gin run? End of the process. We're not going to take all the alcohol out for the simple reason that, um, that it will be too much of rooty taste in the end. Gin is, in general, a little bit better when you cut it a bit earlier. So the end temperature, we're going to put back to 94 degrees centigrade. Force temperature 78.5. I want a small force cut to get a small amount of excessive juniper oils out and the rest I want in so I'll put this one back to 77. That's all I do. Escape. Escape one more. Start the process. We're going for pot distillation because we want taste. We're only going to draw force because there's no heads present in the run. And the only reason we take the force out is actually very easy. At the very beginning of the run, excessive, very sour juniper oils come over. We ditch them by cutting for a little bit of force. Without tails collection? Yes, sir, without tails collection because there's nothing to be found in the tails. Not while making a gin. Is there a batch in the tank? Yes, there is. Heating up started, 18 kilowatts, you can hear it, in about 20-25 minutes so you will start distilling and I'll be back with you. This is the reason why I want you to always take a force cut on your gin run. Very concentrated, very sour and distasteful juniper oil gets over during the first part of the run. This is the force cut and I think you can see the oily mass at the bottom. So this is the uh, total amount of alcohol we collected and here you can see the cloudy juniper oils. You can see the even have difficulty dissolving and there they go slowly and this is the stuff you don't want in your gin because it will cloud stuff up in an extraordinary way but also it will make your gin this tasty first juniper oils get rid of them So we talked about how to make gin and how to cut for those early 
excessive juniper oils. Right now we're in the middle of the run, pretty much the middle of the run. And one of the things you want to remember when making a gin is that the floral smells and tastes come over during the first part of the run. The body of the juniper pretty much comes over in the central part of the run. And if you want a gin that is more rooty in character, has more nuts, flavors in it, that's, that gets over at the end of the run. So floral to start with, body in the center, and rooty tastes at the end of the run. So depending if you want a floral run or a full bodied gin that lasts in your mouth longer, you need to cut smaller, earlier, or you need to cut wider. The way to decide that is by simply smelling and tasting a little bit every now and then. Not the worst job in the world. And if you like the amount of floralness of body and, and rootiness you get over, you dial in an end temperature at the same time as you did this time, and the ice still will help you make the same gin, in this case Odin's gin, over and over again with the same level of perfection.